Welcome to Season 4 of the Art of Teaching podcast. I'm Matthew Green and I'm so grateful that you joined me today. Before we get started, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you that have subscribed, listened and reviewed the episodes. I really do appreciate you taking the time. Welcome to another episode of the Art of Teaching podcast. Dr. Cheyenne Barr is an educational expert helping people to become self-regulated learners so that they can succeed now and in the future. As an education consultant currently based in Canberra, Australia, he is working with educational leaders to rethink professional learning models, innovative teachers ready to shift practice and individuals who are interested in elevating themselves and achieving new levels of success. Shyam is passionate about bridging research with practice and continues to stay engaged with Australian universities. He currently works as an Assistant Professor of Learning Sciences, Design and Pedagogy in the Faculty of Education at the University of Canberra. I hope that you get as much out of this discussion as I did. Dr. Shyamba, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. It's great to be here. It's, uh, I always love chatting with forward-thinking educators about education, so it's, it's good to have the opportunity. Fantastic. Where are you uh, phoning in from this morning? So currently I'm in Canberra. Uh, it's got a, a rainy day outside. Here I am thinking that we're going to get this crystal clear skies and there's sunshine, but not today. <laughs> so I don't know. It looks like it's supposed to be raining all day. Yeah, yeah uh, it's been an interesting summer, I think, for us in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, quite possibly the most important question, uh, what is your coffee order? <laughs> so actually, I don't drink coffee. Uh, I've, never, I've never drunk coffee. Um, I'm a green tea kind of guy. <laughs> well, you are the sec- I just got off a, an interview uh, just before I, I spoke to you, and he also uh, does not drink coffee. And you were the first two people that I've ever interviewed that do not drink coffee. Did you... Is there a reason? Have you? Sorry, I just find this so amazing. Like, it, it was there? Is there a reason why? Have you never tried it? Did you? Are you naturally quite an energetic person? Uh... <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny because when I was in Melbourne, um, you know, obviously I was originally from Melbourne, and yeah. there's such a coffee culture in Melbourne. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> I always felt like I was missing out on something. I was like, maybe I should try it, and I did. I tried it a couple of times, and I just. I think I hadn't really quite acquired a taste for coffee at the time. And I just was like, it's not for me. So yeah. I made that decision quite young and I've just, as a result, never returned to it. Um, so I, yeah, respect I, think, that. I respect that. I think <laughs> it's amazing, like going against the tide. I love it. And to, and to be from Melbourne, which is a, a so I had the privilege of studying down in Melbourne for a short time. Like I, you, you can't walk down the street and not walk past a coffee shop. Everything is let's grab a coffee. Let's, uh, I find that that level of um, uh, discipline that would have that would have meant you not drinking a cup of coffee is quite a, quite profound. So uh, I, I respect that. Yeah. So is there any particular green tea that you enjoy drinking? Uh, no, I'm, I'm you know pretty classic in, in you know most places have a pretty standard green tea. So I can't say I'm too fancy on that front. But I have to in terms of the coffee kind of yeah uh, culture of Melbourne. I remember I worked at a I worked at a school where you know a group of staff would go out every morning tea down to the local coffee shop. Uh, and I, yeah, I was invited every now and then, but because I didn't drink coffee, I, it just was, oh, well, it was, yeah. drink, it yeah. was quite pointless me going for that walk. But um, I always thought, oh, I really am missing out on these, you know, these side conversations that are mm-hmm. so useful just because I don't drink coffee. Maybe I should uh, pick it up. But no, I've, I've stood strong. <laughs> and uh, before we hit record, uh, you obviously are the dad to a beautiful young daughter. And I, I am amazed that, uh, parents of young children who are not caffeinated still manage to function I think that's that's incredible so I don't know what you're doing uh but uh I appreciate you uh I appreciate your determination not to follow the trend (laughs) thanks man yeah it is um a lot of energy management um which I think is a conversation we don't often have really talking about how to manage our energy levels outside of perhaps some of these yeah and societal kind of expectations around coffee etc so yeah um, very careful well, I think it definitely doesn't 
definitely doesn't solve the issue, does it? I mean, for I, I've just finished reading a book um, called Caffeine by I think Michael Pollan, really interesting, um, and it talks about the obviously the caffeine cycles and how um, the the half life I think the quarter life of coffee is twelve hours, so that means there's still a quarter of a cup of coffee still in you twelve hours later. So I had this moment thinking, I don't think I've ever not had caffeine in my system, and I, I wonder if uh, it's uh, I wonder if I probably should just try and get more sleep as opposed to trying. <laughs> anyway, How many coffees do you drink a day? I look, look I, don't, I don't drink. I, I know I sound like a complete addict. Look, I don't drink a lot. Um, I very rarely buy coffees. I have a rule uh, that I won't buy coffee if it's just me um, because it's incredibly expensive and I have bills with children. Um, but I will quite often go down for a coffee on the weekend or grab a, a coffee with my a baby Chino and stuff with my kids. So I probably drink... I probably buy one or two coffees a week and probably have, I definitely have one at home every single morning um, and a few in between. Yeah. So uh, that's a, that sounds pretty reasonable though, in terms of in comparison to others that I've heard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Multiple cups per day. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I appreciate uh, digressing into the wonderful world of caffeine. It's a hot discussion, I think, for a whole another day. But I'm just interested, uh, what is an item that is still on your bucket list um, maybe international travel when we can finally leave the country. Uh, but what's a, what's a, a, a something that's still on your bucket list that you'd love to do? Uh, well, yeah, I've, um, I was thinking about this question uh, and writing a book has been on my list for a while yeah. uh, and it is still on my list. It's actually, I think it's slowly making traction towards the top of my priority list over the next two years. So um, watch this space. And would that be... Uh, um, related to your area of expertise in education, or is this a separate uh, a separate endeavour? Or I will have two interest areas. One is um, you know to help teachers obviously teach self regulated learning in schools. And there's while there's a couple of resources that have been quite good in the in the last kind of ten years, um, I think re research is constantly evolving. And so to try and capture the work that I do with schools in a book, so that those yeah. schools that that don't get the opportunity to work with me directly can still access some of the information I think is the ideal. So yeah, the first book, probably the first book I'll, I'm keen to write is one for educators. Um, mm -hmm. And then the, the other take on that would be one for perhaps the everyday person who, um, who wants to, you know, achieve however they define success in their life, but to leverage self-regulation as a process that can help them do that. And so really writing for the individual rather than kind of the school system or the educator, um, writing for essentially the life student. Um, that's, that's the second, yeah, idea that's floating in my mind. Fascinating. Well, when you are ready to publish, uh, let me know. And we may, yeah. have round, we may have to do a round two. Um, if you could have a dinner party with anybody, obviously your, um, your family can take up a seat, but they're not counted in the numbers. Um, who would be there? So if you could sit down and say, let's say with three people, who would you love to have a conversation with? These can be alive or, or, or past. Um, so Robin Sharma, if you're familiar with Robin Sharma, he's an author, uh, he's a leadership coach from Canada. Um, he has been profound in sort of influencing my thinking over the last 10 years, I'd say. Uh, he's the author of The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Um, which I read when I was 18 years old, actually. Uh, so I was introduced to his, his kind of work quite young. Um, I'd love to have a conversation with him. So he would be, he would be there. Uh, the Dalai Lama, um, again, this is I, when I think back to some of the early books that I read as a young person, I read The Art of Happiness, I think, when I was 20 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, so heavily influenced by that, that age as a young person. Um, and I'd say... Just to um, from an entertainment perspective, I think Will Smith would be great to just have him at the table. He's he just continues to astonish me. I just watched that um, his new film King Richard, um, nice. an advanced screening of that where he, you know he plays Serena Williams and Venus Williams' father uh, in that role. And I, I just think I watched a few interviews of him, and I think he's constantly innovating and progressively thinking about how to change and, and have a positive impact in this world. That's my understanding of others might have a different view. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, uh, I'm just looking at my bookcase now, his book. I, I turn books that I want to read next, I turn them so they face out the front. So every time I walk past them, I feel a little bit of judgment that I should probably finish that <laughs> book. So his book is one of those. Um, yeah. And I have just recently uh, watched a couple of his kind of mini documentaries about um, 
how he has trans essentially how he transformed himself in the process of writing his biography and fitness and i will send those through to you after our discussion he is an endlessly fascinating individual um he's uh i really do respect people that continuously push and challenge the status quo and i think he is he is one of those it sounds like a wonderful dinner party um would love to get invited to that so uh yeah okay. what uh is there a book that you have read uh, that has caused you to stop and reconsider everything. This could be within your sphere. Um, it could be more broadly than that. I know you mentioned a few before, but is there a book that sticks to in your mind that that made you really reconsider everything in your life? Um, yeah, I'd say there's there's probably two. Um, Such a hard question just to say one, isn't it? Like, yeah, I, can I give you two? Is that you okay? can give me two. You can do whatever you like. Yeah. Uh, one was actually I was I was working as an executive teacher uh, a leader um in a school it was a elc by three year 12 school um and we were gifted we had a presentation from a lady named margie warrell if you've heard of margie um she did a presentation she gifted us a book uh the book was called stop playing safe um and it was at that pivotal moment in time it would have been maybe 2014 um i read that book and i thought as an educator am i playing safe in, in terms of the impact that I want to have in education, am I playing safe? And it so really was um, the seed that was planted in, in sort of yeah, pivoting is probably the best word, but shifting me in the way that I was thinking about what I did. And I left my job that year um, and started my own consultancy business. And so yeah, profound that a book had that impact. Wow. So you, what, just take me back to that. So you read this book, you are in a, leadership position in school um, I feel like we have very similar um, career path up until then um, and you, you, you're reading this book you're in a position that people in many ways esteem to be in um, and also by society standards it's very successful it's a good stable job great income great superannuation um, and you read this book and you decide okay I need to make a change what was what was that like because people talk about that that's kind of like oprah winfrey change your life kind of stuff but you actually did it what was that like and was that terrifying was it yeah take us through that process it's really interesting yeah i think it is um so many of us kind of cling to the the safe harbor in that um mm. we, think we look for the security and i still hear it in the narrative now in terms of um you know, jobs um, and, and my conversations with employers about, mm -hmm. yeah, well, you know, don't you, you've got a young child, you know, you need the yeah. security, and, you know, the regular kind of salary and things like that. Those are things that have, um, I'm aware of them, but they've never been um, factors that have been determinants for me in terms of my decisions. Um, I think the way that I view work uh, and jobs is through the lens of kind of service and impact. Right. rather than um, security. And so for me, that moment in time was, was really that, that question of, you know, are you playing safe? For me, that was really questioning, am I, am I on track or am I on the path to being able to serve the education community the best way that I possibly can? Uh, and while I was, you know, I was really enjoying my leadership role at that school, I'd been there for five years, um, you know, I was... I was like, you know, it was, it was a fantastic school to be a part of, thriving kind of community. Um, I sort of had reached a point in that position where I was kind of like, okay, this is great. I can continue to have a really fantastic impact here at this school. But is there something else that I could be doing that could perhaps be serving the community in a, in a broader sense, in a better way? Um, and that probably is a belief that I've had since I set out into schools as a you know, graduate teacher in 2000. And, when did I finish studying? 2006. So, yeah, 2007, my first year of um, teaching. Um, I very quickly in those first two years loved teaching. I, yeah, I adored it and um, I knew it was, it was the right career for me because I just I got so much enjoyment out of it. But I very quickly realised that I was only directly influencing the 25 students in front of me. Um, and that became a sort of a driver for me. It was like, how can I have a greater influence on uh, a greater number of students? Wow, I uh, yeah, I'm I'm getting butterflies, you know, because I think it, it's such a um, it's such an important voice, I think, to um, to listen to, and I don't think a lot of people actually take the time. And and, and 
whatever you believe in, whether it's intuition or, or something else. Like I think it's it's interesting that that they are these if like they're these signals speaking to you, and 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 you can either choose to ignore them, uh, which most people do, and pursue a stable, safe career, which is absolutely fine. But if that's not the thing you're on this earth to do, then to actually have the confidence and the uh, and the, the the boldness to to ask yourself those questions, I think, is is really really important. And was that a, a decision that went down well with, um, say, parents, uh, with uh, loved ones? Uh, how was that? How was that move um, welcomed or challenged by the people in your life? Yeah, I've always found that with any of these hard decisions. Um, mm-hmm. Big decisions. I feel like this is a counselling session for me, by the way, <laughs> so I look forward to getting your invoice after our conversation. <laughs> yeah. so my strategy is always to plant the seed um, as, a, as a, not a hypothetical, but as a big idea very early on mm. um, and, then, and then manifest that idea over time. And so, for example, um, and it, it's happened multiple times in my life where, so, you know, when I finished my degree in the year before I finished my teaching degree, so this is 2006, I wanted to move over to London and teach and work in London for a couple of years. Um, and so I planted the seed with my family at the time. If you told me that I was crazy, uh, they said, you know, you, you, that's, that's going to be really hard for you. You don't have any family over there. You don't have any friends over there. And, you know, automatically you start getting the, even from loved ones, because they're, they're, they're looking out for you. Mm, it tends, yeah, yeah. It's your negative voice in that they're looking out for you, but they're looking for things that are going to make it challenging. They're not looking at the the opportunities necessarily. And so I planted the seed and then, you know, six months, nine months, et cetera, I, I just continued to sort of foster that seed until months, uh, you know, yeah. I, I, off I went to London <laughs> and I lived and worked in London for two years. Um, it was the same with this kind of decision. When I read that book and I thought, okay, hey, I sat down with my, my then, you know, fiancé because we weren't married at the time. I sort of said, hey, this is what I'm thinking. I'm going to pull the plug on work, and I'm going to um, I'm going to try this kind of new direction. And again, it was that kind of you know, I'm just processing. I'm just thinking about this. Um, let's keep talking about it. And so then, as the conversation kind of continues over the six months, the nine months, etc., mm. um, I just continue to foster that idea. Um, and it's happening again now. You know, this is just as a another example. Um, you know, to use before COVID. I was like, oh, I really want to go caravanning around Australia. I want to spend a year or two just caravanning around Australia. This set looks like a great life. And I planted the seed with my wife. And at the time, she's like, that, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. And now, you know, we have a plan for 2024 to make that happen. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. And we can, we can edit your answer to this question out if you like. Um, but are there any uh, seeds that you are currently planting uh, for the next three to five years? Any ideas that, uh, yeah, that you are, uh, any seeds that you're sprinkling? Yeah, so, uh, you know. So this, we can edit this out. I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> like yeah, this is, this is probably news to you, Matt, actually. So I, I have actually just been, so I work, obviously, uh, as an assistant professor of learning sciences at the yeah. University of Canberra. Um, I've been there for the last two years and uh, here's an example. So last year, um, I've only been there two years and last year I was starting to get really frustrated with the tertiary system. The university has been fantastic with me, but I was, I was frustrated with the tertiary system as a whole. It's, it's often driven by frustration. <laughs> I, I completely understand. I'm just currently listing off the things I'm frustrated with in my life and we're, we might have a conversation once we uh, stop recording. Uh, but sorry, I interrupt what you're saying. Uh, and so last year I had really started to entertain the idea of, um, again, that question of am I playing self? You know, it, it continues to repeat itself in my mind even now. And so last year I had conversations with the powers that be at the university um, about different pathways for me that would allow me to keep my foot in the research door but allow me to do more work with schools. Uh, and again, you know, and there were lots of conversations about the security and the safety of, you know, we're in a pandemic and, you know, you've got a young child and isn't it important to, to have that security? Yeah. Um, through multiple conversations now, um, you know, I'm taking some time off, but I, the, the university has recognised the need for the, the work that I do with schools. And so they're supporting me during 2020, 2022 <laughs> um, to, to do more work with schools, which is fantastic. And that's just come through conversations and negotiations, really. So, uh, you know, they're quite... Um, 
adaptable in a way that they're starting to think about that as well. Um, but that's one example of even recently. So I'm, I'm spending more time this year investing time with schools and, and educational leaders and to really help embed and integrate some of this stuff around self-regulated learning with schools. Um, yeah, that's the aim. But moving forward, other ideas? I've got a few big ideas. I won't yeah. say them publicly now. But yeah, no, yeah. no problem. I, uh, I completely understand. So are you more comfortable with change now, I guess, than you have been before? To answer that question directly, yes. Uh, and I would say that comes down to my identity as a learner and how that has been developed or how I've developed that over time. Um, and so I really, you know, as you start to really engage with the science of learning and you understand the importance of discomfort and challenge and um, even frustration can be a really positive part of a learning process. Yeah. Um, and you know that the outcome at the other end of that, if you continue to persevere and you demonstrate resilience, et cetera, is often the greater good. Mm. Um, having that belief that that outcome is going to be there um, probably leads me to embrace the discomfort as part of the process. Fantastic. Really, really, really interesting. I mean, I ask because that's something which I am um, trying to do a lot more. Like I said, I have two young kids. I'm in a, a profession and a job that I, I adore and I, and I love. And I think um, starting to think a little bit more outside the box and to read things that really challenge me and have conversations with people like yourself is... Um, I think I'm definitely enjoying the uh, uh, that sort of feeling in your stomach of oh okay like we need to we need to kind of rethink this and we need to pursue this area of interest and I, um, it's really wonderful to see that um, that's a skill that will serve us for the rest of our life kind of following our gut and going with it and um, if somebody asks you what do you do uh, how do you uh, how do you respond to that because I'd love to hear. Um, some more about your current work and the amazing things that you're doing. So let's imagine we're meeting at a barbecue. Hi, I'm uh, hi, I'm Matt. What, what, what do you do? Terrible question, but what do you do? Hi, Matt. Uh, I'm Shyam. Uh, I help people become better self-regulated learners. Uh, that is the kind of catchphrase that I introduce myself. And the reason I don't say my role as a, you know, as an assistant professor or a consultant is that those are not the drivers for me. My driver is that I help people become better self-regulated learners. And so um, I that that took a bit of rewiring in, in terms of identity because it's so mm -hmm. common for us when I'm I was a teacher. teacher. Yeah. yeah, you know, when you introduce it, oh, I'm a teacher, I work at a school, um, or I'm a, yeah, I'm a leader, I work at a school. And, and so we often start with kind of the title, the role title, uh, rather than the underlying driver. Um, and so it took me a little while to sort of rewire that thinking and to feel comfortable in a social setting where people ask you what you do and they're looking for a, a normal you know response which is like hey I'm a teacher um yeah. Yeah. to really yeah to change that and yeah to be the change I guess in that conversation so um it always when I say that it always leads to interesting questions that I don't know I've always found so much better if I said I was just I, I'm a teacher um they go, oh, okay, have great. Of, yeah, yeah they have an idea of what that is yeah yeah, yeah. So, but you see you, you help people to become uh, better self-regulated so why not i help students or why not i help staff why why are you focused more on um uh, teachers and students working together in school environments yeah uh so one of the ways that we can we can foster self-regulated learning in schools is that is to model it ourselves as teachers Right. Um, and so, yeah, I guess one reason why I work with leaders, I work with teachers and I, you know, I work with students is uh, to recognise that kind of feedback loop that happens across all levels. Um, and that I, I view teachers and even leaders as learners. Whenever I, I run professional learning or I'm working with a school, um, everyone I'm working with, including myself, is a learner in that environment. <laughs> um, we're all learning and even as an adult, I think it's interesting because I think there's an assumption that because we're adults and because of our brain development, et cetera, that we can or should be able to self-regulate. Mm. But I think that's, that's a flawed assumption. Um, even adults older than me, well older than me, um, I still see not self-regulating well. And so I think this is a lifelong endeavour. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's why I work with multiple levels. Why is self-regulation so important for learners? 
Um, so I guess for, for your listeners, I, I should explain what self-regulation is, isn't it? First and yeah. foremost, so uh, in a learning context, so self-regulated learning, um, it's it very much about how we engage in the process of learning. It's often thought of in three phases. So it's this planning, monitoring, and evaluating kind of how we learn. And we're constantly in this, in this cycle of, of phases. Um, I prefer to think about self-regulation in a, in a broader context. And so I would define that as how we as an individual, how a person as an individual, um, their awareness of their thinking, their emotions, their behaviours, et cetera, et cetera, uh, how they, so their awareness of that and how they regulate those towards a desired goal. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's really what self-regulation, even self-regulated learning is in a, in a bit of a nutshell. Um, why is it so important? Because perhaps it's a bit of a textbook response, but our world is changing at such a rapid pace. And our young people, it, more so even now, I feel like it's kind of somewhat exponential in the rate that it, it's changing. And so change is you know, very much the only constant right now. And so our young people, in order to thrive in this kind of changing environment, um, yeah. they need to have this sort of inner compass that they, they understand that, that level of awareness and their ability to regulate those behaviours so they can actually, yeah, they can make decisions um, and thrive in these scenarios. And I think we've seen that with the COVID lockdown, um, recent COVID lockdowns, the pandemic, et cetera those who have been quite effective self-regulators have been able to adapt really well and those who have not have suffered from a range of things everything from low productivity mental illness you know um, feelings of isolation etc cetera, etc cetera, because they haven't had perhaps they've had that first step which is okay they've, they've felt that awareness of okay i just i feel alone or i feel isolated they've mm-hmm. not had the strategies to shift that Shift, yeah. shift themselves out of that state and that's yeah. where they they tend to fall flat yeah really really interesting and there's so many threads i would love to unpack but i'm sure you don't have the time but i, I i'm just interested um how do you do that in your own life so how do you continue to build and we talked a little bit before about sort of embracing discomfort and going with your gut and planting seeds and all that stuff but how do you make sure that you are embodying this stuff that you are not this stuff this uh these things that you are teaching um staff students and um and school leaders yeah so i guess you know if, if we take that as time two steps there in, in terms of awareness and, and then having this knowledge and strategies yeah. and that's similar with this concept of metacognition um yeah, yeah. you know metacognition is constantly defined as kind of knowledge of cognition and knowledge of regulation yeah. or regulation of cognition yeah. anyway. um and so that's that's kind of the awareness and the knowledge of the strategies, right? That that's a, a easy way to put it. And so one thing I do, I do multiple things to develop my awareness. You know, um, and some people, everyone has their own practices. So yeah, this um, is great. I, I'm <laughs> busily scribbling this down. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Uh, so I get up, you know, early in the morning, and I I spend 15 minutes meditating every morning. Um, it is a practice that I installed. So a strategy that I adopted essentially um, maybe five years ago uh, as, as a method of developing greater awareness around myself first thing in the morning. Mm. Um, I journal. So journal is an evidence-based strategy for you know, recording one's thought. And there's there's range of strategies for how you can journal. Um, I'm more a haphazard note-taking kind of guy. So that you know when a thought sort of pops up, I just will note it down. Yeah. Um, and so that just, again, that act of writing something down as you're thinking about it is going to enhance that awareness. Yeah. Um, I engage multiple metacognitive strategies. One of, one of my favourites is self-recording. So, you know, I set myself um, a series of, of tasks and every day that I, you know, in terms of that goal, I would self-record my progress against that goal. Um, and that could be everything from my nutrition, my exercise, my sleep, my rest, my... 10 minutes of reading a book each night, whatever it is, you know, um, I, I'm self-recording that because essentially what I'm trying to do is foster um, greater awareness around the things I want to think about and eliminate some of the negative energy or negative influences that might cloud that. And so I'm really trying to enhance my focus there. So that's one, those are, those are strategies that I use to enhance my own awareness. 
Uh, and then I'm constantly reading, a bit like you, man, like cause we, uh, you were telling me about a number of books you're reading. I'm constantly reading books, particularly in the personal development, personal mastery space, to try and up skill myself in terms mm. of strategies um, that will help me regulate better. Yeah. Um, and it can be everything from sleep to like, yeah, there's, there's so many strategies that I, I'm playing with. And I think I use the word play because what works for me is not necessarily going to work for you. Um, and, and it's not necessarily going to work for the next person. And so I think kind of like we do as teachers, we learn sort of pedagogical strategies. You know, we fill that toolkit as much as we can. Uh, and then we pick and choose based on our personal preference and what works mm. for our students in front of us. Uh, it's the same with self-regulation. Really want to develop a broad range of strategies um, that you can then pick and choose based on your personal preference, but also based on the context in which you find yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really interesting. It's always great to hear people's kind of, I know sort of morning routines and that sort of stuff is a bit of a, um, it, it's something which I think is thrown, thrown around quite a lot, but it's so interesting to hear. I think we do a lot of very similar things in the morning. I love gamifying things and um, using apps to track things. And, and one of the things that I've decided to do this year, and it was only three days ago, is to run every single day um, because I saw a YouTube video and the guy looked happy at the end of it. So I thought I'm going to do that. So, so far, this is day three. So it's hundred percent at the moment. Um, I didn't quite start on January 1st, but just to run three kilometers every single day, because for me, running is a, is a passion that has, I have probably, I probably haven't invested into it as much as I should have over the last couple of years. And we can blame uh, age, fitness, children, all that kind of stuff. But um, so for me, trying to um, regain that habit, I think is, is really important. But I love tracking things on apps. I love building those systems and processes because um, in the words of my wife, you're just a better person when you go for a run. And so like, I think I will listen to her and, uh, and do as she says, which is what a wise husband does. Uh, <laughs> um, so you quoted um, on your website, you, you quote one of my favourite um, writers, uh, unfortunately he has passed away, Stephen Covey, and it says, it is critical, seek first to understand and then to be understood. And what does that quote mean to you? I mean, we've talked about it a little bit. And why is that um, so important in your personal and your professional life? Thanks, Pat. I guess it's, um, so that quote, Really, isn't it? isn't it just everything? It's sorry, I'm yeah, getting well, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. If if we think, I you know, so I'm a qualified coach, and one thing that we're we're taught through sort of coaching training um, is you know different different levels of listening, uh, the quality of the conversation. You know, one of the one of the things I remember from that training was that the the quality of an organisation is dependent on the quality of the relationships that the that exist within the organization and the quality of the relationship is dependent on the quality of the conversation. Um, and one of the biggest factors that influence the quality of the conversation is an individual's ability to listen, mm. to regulate that listening process. And what I love about that quote, which is seen, mm. uh, you know, to understand before being understood that that idea is that we don't go in, even as teachers, we don't go in with these preconceived ideas of exactly what our students should know. Actually, what we do is we go in with the view of understanding what they already know and what questions they have about the topics that we're exploring. Yeah. Um, and then we operate in this kind of shared space with our students responding as part of the quality conversation. And so... That's the way I operate with schools. I, you know, I don't have a, a one size fits all kind of product. I have a few kind of, you know, speaking gigs, et cetera, that schools might be interested in, but I always, I always sit down with the school first and I, I try to build an understanding of what the school values, where they're at in the journey in terms of whatever transformation they're trying to bring about, um, what their student cohort is like, what types of questions their kids are asking, uh, what their teachers are struggling with. That's, I spend a lot of the first kind of meeting, I had a meeting with the school yesterday online and the, the whole hour was really just about understanding where the school was at as opposed to me really pushing, <laughs> you know, my self-regulated learning agenda. No, it was actually about, well, where are you guys at and, and how do you see me fitting with what you're trying to achieve and how can I help you do that? 
Um, yeah. Is, I mean, like I said, that is applicable to so many things. I think about when I'm, um, last night I was cranky with my children because I had to do some work and, and my kids were going crazy and getting out of bed. And I just, I had this moment and I'm thinking, okay, look, I'm speaking to Cheyenne tomorrow. He talks all about self-regulation and all that stuff. I probably should model this. And so what I did is I, is, and I had this quote in the back of my mind and, and I went in and I just thought, okay, like what's, what's really got going on here? My little girl was scared because she had nightlight had broken and she was tired and she was cranky. And I thought, okay, what I need to do now is be a dad. All the other stuff I should probably be doing doesn't matter. Um, but I need to seek first to understand where she's coming from. And, and this quote is so applicable to our relationships and so applicable to our classrooms. And I think it's, it's really important to, to take a step back and to take your ego off the table and say, how can I serve you? How can I, how can I help you? What's the nature of the problem? Because we all go into things in terms of organisations where we, we think we know what's going on when actually we need to keep myself, I'm talking to myself now, I need to actually keep my mouth shut and listen and try and find out what is at the essence of this and what's behind this behaviour or this outcome. And, and so it's really, it's such a simple and a beautiful and a profound quote. And I think it just sums up so nicely the work that you're trying to do, which is to get people to stop and to think and to, um, and to take the time just to, uh, just to try and get to the bottom and really work out exactly what's happening. So um, I love that you've got that on your website. I think that's, I think that's brilliant. And thank you for embodying, um, em embodying that so well. Um, Lovely to hear that you modeled that with your daughter. I did. I thought, oh, Dada, like, I need something to talk about tomorrow. I'm going to have to uh, try and be a good, try and be a good, uh, a good parent here. But I, I think it's, I mean, on a serious note, though, classrooms and, and schools are pretty crazy, pretty stressful places. And I think it's easier said than done uh, to take the time to reflect on your practice, to think about your thinking, to develop those metacognitive strategies, because we're just constantly moving from one thing to the next. Um, what are some of the practical things we can do? in the classroom to help build some of those metacognitive strategies or those self-reflective practices. Um, because as you would know from being in classrooms, they're pretty crazy and there's a lot going on. How do we, how do, we do that as educators and create that culture? Yeah, so, so Matt, just to clarify there, are we talking in terms of how do we as teachers foster mm. our own reflective practice and our own self-regulation or how do we do that with our students in the classroom? Uh, probably how do we, uh, probably both actually, how do we embody that for our students and also how do we create an environment where our students feel they can do that? And that was a very long-winded question. Thank you for uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to clarify. Thank so, you. Um, one quote, well, not even a quote, but one idea perhaps, a belief that I started to, to manifest is that um, if it's not a priority, so if you don't have the time, it's not a priority. I just want to make sure I was getting that right. And, and that's something... I've, I've learned really the hard way, I think, is that so many educators are kind of, they're a bit like they're, they're on the sort of mouse wheel. <laughs> You're right, there's so much happening so often. Um, we can wait for someone else to change the structures for us. We can wait for a school to say, hey, we value reflective practice, so we're going to put in these structures in place so you guys as teachers can do that. Uh, or we can acknowledge our professional autonomy and say, I value reflective practice I value self-regulated learning so I'm going to commit time to it um, and so often teachers will say to me hey shy like you know we've got so many curriculum demands we've got so many competing priorities um, we value self-regulated learning but where does it where does it fit um, and that's yeah you know, I often will say to them well if it's if it's if you don't have the time for it it's, it's clearly not a priority in terms of those other priorities you can't have you know, we can only kind of target in on, on so many priorities at once. You can't have 100 priorities. Mm. That's just mm. 100 things. <laughs> um, and so you've got to make decisions. We have to make choices about this. Um, and so some teachers will do this. I think I was probably one of those educators that, that made that choice as, a, as a start. I was a science teacher, you know, teaching in a, a secondary school. Um, I made that choice, conscious choice, that I was not going to let the science curriculum get in the way of what I, what I thought um, was the bigger picture. So I was not going to let the urgent items trump the important items. That's what I, mm -hmm. and so I, I shifted from teaching science 
to teaching kids how to learn science. Yeah, really. um, and that was that was a pretty cool shift for me. So, so in terms of what teachers can do in the classroom, I'd say as, a, as an individual, try and start to think about your own reflective practice. You know, what structures do you have in place in your own? You know, do you take a moment after a lesson to do you, do you give yourself that time to sit and take five minutes to, to just reflect on the lesson? Uh, do you take the time to reflect on where you want to go with your education career and the, the, the impact of the type of service you want to have in education? Do you have a coach? You know, coach is a fantastic um, kind of opportunities because, you know, you, you're committed to a certain time. You've got an, um, an alternative perspective there. They ask really good questions to get you to think or reflect at a deeper level. Um, mm -hmm. I know some schools have coaches uh, or they train people to be coaches. Can you get access to one of those coaches? Are they a coach that is only focused on instructional practice or are they focused on a, on a broader set of skills, a more holistic picture of you as an educator in terms of what you're trying, mm. to, trying to achieve? Wow. Those, yeah, sorry, those would be things that I would suggest for the teacher. And then obviously modelling that for students would be the, the teaching, explicitly teaching those strategies to students would be one thing and the other thing would be modelling those for our students would be the, the second. Yeah. I um, This year, uh, I started asking my students, I don't know why I didn't do this earlier, but for the first time for feedback on my teaching, uh, which was um, some days brutal, uh, but also endlessly fascinating. So I uh, started positioning a number of QR codes around our classrooms um, that at any point in my lesson, students could get up, scan the QR code, and it took them to a Google form. And some of the questions were, um, do you feel like Mr. Green listened to me today? Um, do you feel like he, um, do I have an understanding of what was taught? How could he do things better? And uh, depending on if a child had been in trouble from me the day before, depending on the, the level of brutality that the responses uh, displayed. But it was, it was fascinating because I thought um, our clientele are our students. Like these are the people that we are serving. And in any other industry, whether it be architecture or construction or whatever it may be, we ask the clients what they want. Um, but for some reason, we don't do that with our students. And so it was fascinating and something which I will be um, taking in, obviously, to 2022, because I think the feedback was amazing and starting to feedback and survey the team that I work with and ask them, how am I going? Because help me reflect on my practice. And I think it's, you get some really, really meaningful feedback when you do one of those 360 surveys, when you, um, and you just ask people, because I think it's important to be um, consciously aware of how you come across, whether it be professionally or in the classroom. And so to get some of that feedback is, is absolutely priceless. And so, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing to do that with my, with with my students and to find out like if I'm if what I'm doing isn't working then let's change something because you're the ones that should be learning and if you're not that's on me yeah that's a fantastic strategy man I I, I love the idea of you leveraging kind of yeah almost a 360 degree kind of model but doing that yourself to yeah. get that feedback um it's to me that models learning so again if we identify as a learner first mm -hmm. and foremost and we are actively seeking feedback to help us move forward with our learning and that's what you're doing. So it's, that's great to hear. I, I work with some schools where teachers are fearful of, of that feedback. Um, of course they would be. Yeah. Like, I mean, that makes, like, it, it does, I, I think, sorry, I didn't mean to go, that does make sense though, why they, why they wouldn't want that. But I think let's have the awkward conversations. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. It, it suggests, so this is kind of bringing in a bit of cog slack kind yeah. of, thinking in is that you know are our, our, our teachers um thinking more from the performance mindset that you know feedback from their students is going to negatively reflect my performance perhaps that that might be where the fear is coming from this perception yeah. that it might as opposed to a real mastery learning orientation which is simply that this feedback no matter how uncomfortable it might be to digest and process is going to serve me to become a better teacher. Um, that would be that would be the learning orientation. And I do question how many of our teachers perhaps are finding themselves on the performance side of the fence rather than the mm. learning side of the fence. And this is a, a, a much broader and, and fascinating discussion about how we set up structures and accountability in schools and what the purpose of schooling is. And uh, it's it, it really interesting. It's so great that I think one of the many 
positive things to come out of these last 18 months is that people are starting to ask those questions about what are the purpose of schools, why are they here? They have to be so much more than just academic performance and ranking. Um, they And so I think it will be really interesting, I think, to see some of these studies coming out around well-being, around the relationship between students and teachers. And I think um, your work is very... Um, it's fascinating and, 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 and really needed, I think, now more than ever, which is uh, yeah, really, really important, really interesting. <laughs> um, Shyam, are you um, naturally an optimistic person? And do you think, uh, if I was to ask some of your friends, do you think they would agree? Yes, I would say they would. <laughs> I would agree, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, yeah. Um, yes, to answer your question, yes, I think my family would say perhaps I'm at times overly optimistic. Mm. Uh, I've been yeah. called annoyingly optimistic, which I think is a compliment. I don't know, I don't know how to take that, but I'm like I've been called worse, so annoyingly optimistic is uh, is okay. That's a compliment. Yeah, it definitely is. I'll take it because you um, and I feel like I am uh, Twitter stalking you now. But on uh, the 18th of March, you wrote, "How do you protect your optimism when confronted by pessimistic views of others?" Um, I know you were asking the Twitterverse that, but I would just like to get your thoughts on how you do that. Yeah, so actually, that was that was a question. That, as someone who is quite overly, maybe annoyingly optimistic, um, yeah. I was finding myself in that in that moment when I tweeted that. I was finding myself in a situation where, in an organisation, um, you know, tertiary education and conversations that I was having, I was just finding that perhaps others weren't sharing the same optimistic views that I mm -hmm. thought could exist in in education, and so. Uh, I was looking out to to say, hey, I, perhaps I need some new strategies here to protect my optimism and keep me afloat in this in this space. Uh, Victor Purden, I don't know if you're familiar with Victor Purden. He, um, the Centre for Optimism, basically, uh, he does some great work in terms of exploring um, optimism, interviewing people who had a research in the space of optimism. He actually he saw that tweet. Now I, I've only known Victor through. Twitter really um, but he called me that afternoon and he said hey Shai um, saw your tweet <laughs> nice to have a chat with you you know finally kind of we've never spoken on the phone never spoken on Zoom or anything like that uh, I've known him just across kind of social media um, no. and we were connected through a school so that's how we connected on social media but um, I, I never met him and, uh, and he, he reached out to me. He said, hey, you know, talk to me. What's, what's happening? And I, I explained that this was the situation I was in. Um, you know, what strategies do you have for me, Victor? And he was so generous. This is the kind of the generosity that um, someone in his stature, the, the work that he's doing, you know, for him to reach out to me and just share that um, was yeah. phenomenal. So he just, he gave me some really good strategies. One was, um, which they're nice reminders sometimes, even if you have the strategy, sometimes you need the prompt. Uh, you know, he, he reminded me of the importance of um, journaling every day, which is something I already did. But what he did was he, he enhanced my practice. He took it to another level. He said, hey, if you install the question of what's the best thing that happened today, it automatically so takes your, your thinking, your journaling from just a general reflective practice to a focus on the best thing that happened in the day. And that's going to enhance your optimism, right, because it's going to leave you a feeling feeling good because you've, you've had a, a positive experience and it could be anything from a work related positive activity, a parenting related positive activity it could be anything, you know, I had a nice drink, a nice coffee or whatever it is. Um, so really using that question. And so it could be one that I, I do this with students now uh, when I do check-ins, you know, at the start of a lesson, I'd say, Hey, uh, what's one good thing that's happened to you this morning. And so instantly I'm, I'm saying, let's, let's take, and shift to an optimistic kind of mode, you know, mm. more positive and stress-based kind of positive psychology mode in, in that way. So that was one strategy. The other strategy that he shared that I thought was quite useful was to actively seek out the optimists in my organisation and to almost form um, a bit of an optimist kind of group that, that mm. was essentially a support group. Um, I don't know if you've read a book, Matt, called Connected. Um, no, but I am frantically writing down all of these people to speak to and all, <laughs> all these books to read. So Connected, yeah? Yeah, there's a book called Connected. It's, it's written by two researchers. Um, it talks all about the influence of individuals on your thinking. Um, wow. Their wow. research has looked into, like, you know, 
um, you know, the, the core group of five people that you spend the most amount of time with, the influence that that has on your thinking and ability. And then if you, you go back one step further and you think about the five people that each of those individuals spend their most amount of time with, that influences your thinking as well. And so what, what Victor was saying to me was think about, reconsider, which I've, I've done in the past, but I needed the reminder at the time was like, who am I spending my time with? At, you know, at this, you know, at, at that junction kind of thing. Um, yeah, I've joked with friends about going through friend restructures because I'm constantly thinking about who's in my circle. Um, yeah. So yeah, this was kind of a nice reminder of that. Anyway. So, and, and you don't have to name anybody, maybe just sort of say the position they are in your life, but who is in your kind of optimism bubble, whether it be professionally, personally, your wife, your, or you probably should you probably should say that one um but yeah who's in your optimism bubble who do you go to when um when you just need a little bit of a bit of a perspective yeah uh, so i think there's we can think about this in terms of like a physical being like a person yeah, and yeah. i have i'm a big fan of investing in um bringing people into your um mm -hmm. that circle and so i have uh, I'm part of a business coaching program where, you know, um, I have access to uh, an outstanding business coach uh, on, you know, on more or less a weekly basis. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I paid money to bring that person into my circle. Yeah. I have a personal trainer uh, who lives in Dubai, but I used to train with in Melbourne, who's the best trainer I've ever trained with. I've trained with multiple. Um, he is so holistic in his approach. I wanted to bring him into my circle. I wanted to make sure that he was part of that influence. So, you know, he's my trainer. I pay him to have him as part of my influence. Um, obviously, my wife. You did in personal training sessions with this guy in Dubai. So he's my online trainer. So as opposed to, you know, um, the past where I'd, I'd just kind of go to a gym and have a trainer for 50 minutes. Yeah, right. Amazing. Um, yeah. This is a much more holistic health and well-being approach. Um, you know, it's not like I'm like, yeah, I just want to, you know, put on some muscle. I, mine's really about I want to have high energy. Um the work that I do and the people that I serve. Great. Uh, so he helps me tweak my lifestyle to make sure that I can do that at a high level. Wow. Uh, but th these are the things that I, I think. So there's there's people that I have access to in Canberra, etc. Or you know, like yourself on Zoom and things like that, who are in my circle, uh, my family, etc. And then there's there's perhaps people that are outside of reach of that circle, and I'm like, I really want to bring them in. Great. Can I pay them to bring them into that circle? And if I can't. I can't afford them maybe, or, uh, you know, they're just too far out of reach. Um, I'll read their books. Yeah, great. Because that's another way of bringing someone into your circle, isn't it? You're, you're essentially engaging with that person through written form. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's interesting because, sorry, it's interesting to see just how intentional you are with that. And I think that's, it, it, it's really important because the people, my nan used to say to me, show me your friends and I'll show you who you like. And I'm like, good one, nan. But she's absolutely, absolutely spot on. I think the people you surround yourself with, I mean, there is no one that I love hanging out more than with my wife. And two, um, she's someone that endlessly inspires and challenges me to do things and all of that kind of stuff. But also she's just fun to have a chat with. Um, and so I, I feel so grateful for those people in my life that you can just phone up and go, hey, or, and you've also got a lot of these sort of, um, like you're saying, these great authors that you may not be, and like I said, unfortunately, uh, uh, Stephen Covey has passed, but his work still lives on and he's such an incredible um, uh, point of influence for me. But it, we really are fortunate, aren't we, to have access to some incredible thinkers, both in per person, or virtually and um it's really inspiring to see that even at someone uh, that has achieved so much as as you have you're still constantly um sharpening the saw that's another stephen covey thing yeah. um, and making sure that you are looking after yourself that you are um constantly pushing um respectfully pushing boundaries and um and also redefining and relearning and thank you for embodying the uh, the things that you uh, that you that you teach i think it's really 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 important um a couple of closing questions I, I do want to be um respectful of your time so it would be amiss of me not to ask you um what you think the current uh, ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has taught us about schools and the way that they operate um I think on so on one hand um what it has shown us over the last two years is that 
schools, education kind of communities can be very adaptive. Mm. And I think on one hand, that's, that's demonstrated that. Uh, on the other hand, it's shown us that actually most of us are taking quite an emergency kind of response to it. Every time remote learning occurs, we mm. are okay, we're just going to kind of, it's very haphazard in a, in a way we, we respond to it. And now schools, the conversations I'm having schools are much more intentional that they're perhaps because it's been two years now or so, um, they're realising that perhaps it's going to be around a little bit longer. Uh, the current current pandemic kind of situation, um, even with vaccinations, is suggesting that now we've got, okay, we could have teaching staff who are sick or have COVID uh, and therefore can't work. If they're asymptomatic, okay, they can't come to school, but they can work from home maybe. Um, if we've got students who have COVID, or, you know, um, then they won't be able to come to school again if they're asymptomatic or they, they won't be able to engage in remote learning necessarily. And so now we've got multiple levels. It's, it's almost more complex now than it was when we just all went into lockdown. We all were remote mm -hmm. learning, but we were all to yeah, some yeah. degree protected to, at some level. Now, you know, COVID, the number of people that have COVID um, and that spreading kind of, I don't know, that, that spreading network almost is, is much louder. It's, it's, it's much harder to contain now. And so yeah, schools yeah. are really thinking about okay, accepting it in the current form and accepting that the unknown is ahead of us, but intentionally planning their, their school systems that therefore their school systems are more resilient to any unpredictability essentially. Um, mm. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm seeing in the conversations I'm having with schools. So they're engaging me in terms of so this bigger umbrella around the, the way they're approaching kind of blended hybrid uh flip whatever they're choosing to, to go with whatever their school is choosing to go with um they're seeing self-regulated learning as a critical component of that um and they're recognizing that okay hey our teachers are looking for more support in this area um so hey you know shy you're part of that puzzle yeah can, can we work together and bring that together to, to help us be intentional in this space fantastic it's um it's really it's fascinating i think the space that you're in and i love i love change i love that there are these really big traditionally quite rigorous sorry quite rigid organizations that are being forced to ask these questions and i i haven't always but currently i thrive uh when these questions are asked because i think it, it gets us back to the essentials of why we as educators are doing what we're doing um and that's to uh, uh, teach young people and educate people and to build these environments where people feel safe and valued it's so much more than just academic outcomes and so I think while some people feel may feel a little bit uncomfortable with this um, I love it I think it's really exciting there's never been a better time in my view to be involved in our um, in, in our wonderful um, profession um, where can we find out more about you uh, so I have a website, shinebar.com. It's pretty easy. Actually, if you just Google my name. Um, <laughs> I don't know many people called Shyam, so it's a good, from a marketing point of view, it's a, it's a great website to have. Yeah, I feel really blessed, actually. So people often just type my name into Google. If you go first name, surname, like it, I'm the only person that comes up pretty much on the, the first two pages of nice. results. Um, so I'm pretty lucky in that sense. Uh, website, obviously, is one area. I've got some blogs. I've got resources for teachers um, and educators up there as well. Um, a few examples of the types of services that I work with, you know, if there are schools that are interested in working with me. Um, I have a contact form on there, so you can, you know, if anyone's keen to get in touch with me, you can get in touch with me through that form. Sometimes you see those forms and you're like, who does it go to? It just sends me an email, right? <laughs> so I just get an email through the website and then I can respond to you directly. Uh, but Twitter, LinkedIn, like I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook as well, but Twitter and LinkedIn tend to be kind of the, the spaces that, seeing more popular with educators, Instagram maybe is increasing with teachers. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm on all of those and it's just that shine bar. Great. And a final question. You have been so um, incredibly generous with your time. Uh, in uh, Australia, we are just about to head back into the classroom. Uh, we're in our final week or so of school holidays. Um, what message uh, would you like to get out to a group of teachers that are about to go and stand in front of a classroom uh, maybe for the first time? Oh, for the first time, so just about to. I would say, so this is um, probably advice that I was given um, as, a, as a first year art teacher, is focus on the learning. 
Uh, now that might sound really simple um, on face value, but so many of us get caught up with behavior, particularly first year our teachers, we, we get caught up with behavior management. We get caught up with curriculum demands. Um, we get caught up with organizational politics, but if you bring everything back to the core reason, which is why we exist, which is to help our young people develop as learners, um, if we focus on the learning, then you can't go wrong. That's that's the advice I was given. It's been a game changer for me. And hopefully, it will serve others in the same way. Fantastic. And I know I said final question last time, uh, but what advice would you give uh, to school leaders that are about to go back to their school for 2022? Yeah. Um, so this knowing the as well knowing that there's the unknown ahead of us, I think em embrace change, embrace. Uh, the opportunities that come with this would be a really good time, I think, to to really adopt that optimistic view um, in the same way that you do, Matt. In, in that every challenge that that gets presented to us during twenty twenty two is an opportunity for growth and learning. And so, no matter what happens with this pandemic, in the way that it uh, stifles us that is an opportunity for us to develop a better education system that is more resilient, uh, that is more responsive to our young people um, and this changing world that we're in. Fantastic. I cannot think of a better point to end our conversation. Um, Shyam, thank you so much uh, for taking the time out of your schedule. It is an honour and a privilege to talk to you and I can't wait to, uh, uh, to see what's next for you. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. It's been, uh, it's been awesome. I love it. So I appreciate it. Um, and all the best. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the Art of Teaching podcast today. I hope that you, like me, got some valuable insights out of our discussion. For show notes, please visit theartofteachingpodcast.com. I've one favour to ask. If you could please head to the iTunes page of the podcast and rate and review the episode. This would really help to get the interviews and resources to as many people as possible. Also, I've created a private Facebook group so that we can continue the discussion after each episode. The link is in the show notes. Thank you again for listening and until next time, 